But either way, it was a big turnout. Again, like Friday was a decent turnout, obviously. But then Saturday was the big day. That was Paul Skeen's day. Record-breaking crowd. Uh, so, yeah, again, like just tell us a little bit just behind the scenes about your weekend. Yeah, so I don't I don't I've I haven't covered many games, but I don't have it Saturday was crazy. I do not have another parallel for Saturday other than Strasburg. And Strasburg Strasburg's debut was obviously a whole like another level because I mean ESPN was there, but that was also in Altoona. And yeah. Cole didn't draw a crowd like that. Tyon didn't draw a crowd like that. You know, Pedro didn't draw a crowd like that. Henry Davis didn't draw a crowd like that. So I just, they, they smashed their attendance record, man. It was, they, it was number one by almost a thousand. I think the official number was like 10,164 and it beat out like a previous, um, a double a double header attendance number that they had set in like 2003 of like 9000 something interesting nine i think it was 9255 so yeah like you're saying basically like a whole thousand that's that's insane yeah no it, it was how much uh how much purple and gold was in the stands also <laughs> surprisingly little but i did see a few i did see a few there was um there was an air force military band on hand um they really good rendition of the national anthem obviously because it's the air force military band um but yeah they they pulled out all the stops cool well let's get into it paul Skeens. and actually i guess before we really talk about paul because you talk about the commotion and everything i heard there was top-notch security because word is bucko mike tried to break in and get the livy done oh my god are we are we really doing this now (laughs) we can bypass it let's talk about no no let's we'll we'll talk about it so around the fifth or sixth inning there was a a gathering of young hooligans about 20 of them who quickly gathered and they were running up the steps of the main concourse. And we saw them from the press box, like just sprinting up the tunnel, like sprinting up towards like, cause, cause the, um, the curve PNG field only has like two levels. There's no like third floor and like, or, or like a exclusive club level or anything like that. So to get to the press box, it, it's just, you know, normal fans can walk around around the entrance to the press box. Just, they can't get in normally. Um, and so they were headed up towards the, the right field entrance to that tunnel. And so immediately everybody in the press box saw that. And we went, Oh my God, because where Paul Skeen's girlfriend was the only, I think the only way to get to that spot was going through the doors to the press box. Oh. Yes. So I can just imagine the look on all of your faces. So we were literally holding the doors in case they got past like the first wave of security. <laughs> That's funny. So and and would, I guess like I kind of want to talk about this too just to me and justice because <laughs> Justice De Los Santos and I were literally holding the doors. <laughs> well, I guess, again, like, that's just what, like, Paul Skeen's mainly, like, you're talking about, like, Strasburg was the one you compared to. Cole didn't have this. Tyron didn't have it. But, like, Skeen's, uh, you know, Strasburg had, like, the entire year being on ESPN in college. I mean, everyone had eyes on him where Skeen's didn't. Skeen's kind of got to that point later on in the year but it wasn't like, hey, you got to watch this guy throw 102 right. miles an hour. And every start was on like Strasburg. But like what Skeens does have with the other guys you don't talk about is like the star power quality. Again, like he oh has my been God. that national attention. <laughs> and now like he's got the girlfriend that I see on my TV in every MLB commercial break. You know, so Pirates, I don't know what it is. I mean, Cole Tucker <laughs> first, now Paul Skeens. They just have star power quality. <laughs> Anyways, go to Paul the Gazette Tink. if you want further coverage on Livy Dune, man. I just- Paul 
takes the mound. We had the NS9 game. They talked about what we wanted to see. Certainly wasn't the best uh, outcome you would have wanted, but talk to us about it. So I was, they let um, media people get down behind home plate, like field level uh, for, for pictures and stuff. So that's where I spent the first inning. I plan on spending, I plan on spending the first inning there and then heading back up once the bottom of the first started and to get back in time for um, the, the top of the second, because anybody who's been to Altoona knows that the, the elevator to get to the upper levels is the world's slowest elevator. So you have to you have to get there early if you want to get there on time. But uh, that was the plan. So I was right to I think it was I was in section one eleven um, for Paul's first inning. Um, he was kind of all over the place. Um, I think he was just he was trying to pitch a little too much. Um, he avoided barrels, but I mean two singles, two walks, the double. I mean, you'll you'll get banged around at any level if you're missing your spots that badly. Um, and it wasn't that they were like he was missing the zone badly, but he was missing his spots badly, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, the stuff was still good because it's Paul Skeens. Of course, the stuff is going to be good. It's never not good. Um, but he was missing pretty badly with the fastball. I thought he located his breaking pitches a little better, but he was still missing a little bit with that. He was just trying to dot the corners too much when, I mean, in reality, like these are double a hitters, you know, you should be, you should be attacking them a little more, you know, more often than not, you can get away with 102, you know, middle up to a double a hitter. Mm-hmm. Which is something he's shown again. Like we talked about a little bit, the, the quality of hitters he's faced to this point is well below his level. I mean, he's in the complex league, and then he's in low A. You know, once you get to maybe Greensboro High, that's when you're probably comparable to the you know the SEC. So this is obviously you know someone brought in the chat too. This is probably the best talent wise like lineup he's he's faced in his career. Yeah, no, this is probably these are probably the most skilled hitters he's ever faced. Right. Like the, the maybe maybe not on an individual level, but on a complete like one through nine, that lineup was probably the best, the most skilled lineup. It certainly has the most experience of any lineup he's ever played. Sure. So, you know, again, like my takeaway from it was it's not doom and gloom. It's not, oh my god, this no. guy's a bust. No, it's the you, best lineup he's faced. If like you he thought said, Paul like, Skeens was never going to have a bad outing in his professional career, I ju- I don't know what to tell you. And the, the reality, I mean, he talked about this because he was like, I, I think that's why he was trying to pitch as opposed to just like filling the zone and, and you know, getting work in, which is really what this is. Um, it's, it's, I, I talked to him a little bit about how like being on such a strict um, pitch count limit, such a strict innings limit changes his mindset. And it was, you know, knowing that you're not going to face you know, a second or even a, you know, a third or even a second time through the order, you know, that changes how you approach it. Um, I know he has experience. He was air force's closer. Um, so he, it's not like he, that, that experience is foreign to him, but in terms of this particular situation, it was more like, I'm going to throw all of my pitches. I'm going to, you know, try to learn as much as I can. And, And I think, I don't know what the term for this would be. Flustered is the right term because he wasn't flustered. It was just like, I think that mindset got him pitching differently than he usually did. He was, he was trying to be perfect and, and trying to, he, he was trying to be perfect rather than be the pitcher that he is. Gotcha. That kind of makes sense. And I guess I didn't really, usually, that. usually you want people to be pitchers over throwers but I think in that situation, it would have been better for him to be more of a thrower. Well, I think part of it too is, I mean, his stuff is so good that it'll, like you're saying, like it'll play. He can fill up the zone and his stuff is just so good that batters are just naturally probably going to miss. But when you're not right. hitting your spots and you're not filling the zone and you're, you know, allowing walks to happen and such, something like this happens. You know, when you're trying to hit that spot, I, I definitely can understand where you're coming from. But I guess also, what I'm saying here is I never thought too deeply about that, but it makes sense. 
he's on a limited pitch count. You know, his mindset is going to be different. He's not going out yeah, there no, like a normal a, star. It's not a starter mindset, especially right. when he's like just trying to get work in at his first time at a professional level. He's going to want to throw all of his pitches. He's going to want to try to learn, you know, what works, what doesn't against hitters that are at a skill level that he has never faced before. And so I guess that leads to my next point, too, is that kind of makes sense, too, because I don't think and like us, like, of course, we jokingly say bust. Right. But I don't think we should be looking at this as a results based. No, season it, this isn't for this him, isn't a result for him. It's, yeah. Like it this just, is almost like spring training heading into the offseason for him. It That's pretty much exactly what it is, because uh, John Baker was there. Um, Saturday. I didn't expect him to be available to the media. My impression is that he was going to be there with family. Uh, for those who don't know, John Baker is the head of player development. And, you know, what, what John said was that you, you have to be cautious with Paul and the, the plan is to get acclimated to the perfect, to the professional level. That's what this is. And, you know, the reason why he's at double A is because that needs to be, he needs to get acclimated to a professional level. That's openly challenging him. And that's right. not, that's not, that's not going to happen at the FCL. That's not going to happen at Bradenton. It's not going to happen at Greensboro. You know, double A is, is where he needs to be right now. It's where, you know, he can best get acclimated to the professional level that, that is openly challenging him, as they said. So that's a good point to bring up this next question because we've been guessing, we've been guessing, you know, you hear Char Charrington say things. So is it going to be Altoona basically for the rest of the year for him? For at least the rest of the curve season. Um, I was, I asked John Baker about this. I asked uh, Krabby about this. Uh, Calix Crab, he's the curve manager. Um, and both of them said similar things. I think the exact quote from John Baker was, it would be a fair expectation for him to remain with the curve through the rest of their season. Now, does that mean that it's he's not going to make his way to Indianapolis? I don't know. Because, excuse me, Indianapolis season ends about one week after the curve season does. And Indianapolis season, I know... He's not going to pitch in the major leagues. He's not. Right. He's he's not going to be on the 40-man roster. But at the end of the year, if they could find a way to like some 40-man trickery, some taxi squad trickery, where they could get him in uniform and with the team, I could see it happening. But he's not going to pitch, and he's not going to be on the 40-man roster. Right. But so that was like my thought too is I would love to see him make like his final outing in Indianapolis. So more or less what you're saying is it, it's it's pretty much done, see. done deal that he's going to yeah. be an Altoona at the end of their, their season. Right. But there's still that possibility that he could make maybe one more start in Indianapolis. I think so. It, it just it just depends on what his pitch count total is by that right. point. Um Although I assume that's going to be kept in such strict limits that that's not going to be any kind of worry place that they would be with that. Um, the same thing with the innings. Um, I know they've explicitly stated 20, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it were less than that total. Like I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if it was a, like somewhere around 12 to 15. Oh, okay. Oh. When so it's all maybe even time. substantially lower. Yeah, because I, I did point like I did notice when Charrington said that he said under 20. So it didn't necessarily say 20, like it's going to be at 20. They say under, but again, is that 10? Is that 15? Is it 20? So you're thinking maybe about 15 yeah, 12 to maybe 15. as a real cap. Well, it's not as a real cap. I, I don't think they'd be uncomfortable going higher than that, but just like realistically with how far they've been letting him go into games and how many games that are left. Right. Um, cause he's with pitched, also saying he's not going to be stretched out. Cause he's right. Cause he's pitched what? 4.2 innings now. Yes. Yeah. So there there's, he has like four remaining starts by schedule alone, um, with the curve. If, if he is going to finish the season with them, finish their season with them. 
so if you like math that out, that's like eight. So that's like 12, you know, assuming they let him go two and he does pitch two. Mm-hmm. So that's 12 innings. And then you add in a start in Indianapolis if he does go there. And that's like, you know, 14, 15. So realistically, I, I, I don't see him getting to that 20 number. They're, they're, wor- they're going to be working well within those parameters. Sounds good. All right, cool. So obviously you had the post with, with him. Anything, any comments he said, anything that you take away from that? Um, yeah, he's, he's really cerebral. Um, the comparisons I got to him a lot were Anthony Solometto, who's a guy I think we're going to talk about later. Um, but just in terms of another quote from, from John Baker, it, it's John Baker was talking about how unusual it was to see a guy who is as uniquely self-aware as Paul is that when he was introduced to the organization right off the bat, it was, here's what I, I want to work on. Here's what I'm going to do. You know? So they were really impressed with that. Um, and Paul said it in the post game, you know, it, it wasn't like an obstacle to overcome as much as it was just like a bad outing. Gotcha. Right. It wasn't, ad- that's, that's the term. It wasn't adversity. That was the specific quote. It wasn't adversity. It was a bad outing. You know, so, I mean, Paul was open about this, you know, he, bad outing, two walks or ki- two walks will kill you. You know, he said he did a decent job avoiding the barrels, which he did. Yeah. Just, I mean, standard stuff coming off him and out in like the one that he had. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. So, um, yeah, again, it wasn't the outing that you wanted to see. No. But I always look at outings like this too. Like, I mean, you want these. You said it wasn't adversity. That's actually a word and term I used. Like, you want to have some adversity. I mean, he's just gone through and just dominated LSU. Like, just dominated. Comes in here. He's in the, you know, you mentioned the complex league. He's in Branton, just dominates ones. So, like, I wouldn't mind to see him have a struggle because, again, you, to me, how I feel, you learn best through struggles. If he's just coming in here and he's mowing down everyone and then, uh, hey, somehow or another, maybe he starts day one for, for the Pirates or he doesn't whenever he makes his you know debut. You don't want his like very first struggle maybe coming in the major leagues. So that's why like, I always kind of look at this as an opportunity and like take a pause about this. Like he, he had a struggle and it was here. Yeah, I, it, again, if you expected Paul Skeens to never have a bad outing in his professional career, you just, you haven't been watching this sport very long, you know? Um, it's not how it works. You need yeah, no, that's, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's just not how it works. Right. And All right. It, it's, it's better if you get those out of the way now, even though these outings don't really matter, but it's, it's better that you learn from these and learn what you need to do because the, the main takeaway from this outing was that you need to, you need to be a little more of a thrower. I, that's a bad way to put it, but at, at, at this level, at the double a level, you know, your stuff can dominate people still here. You know, For nobody, sure. nobody at the double a level has this kind of stuff. Nobody at the saw, AA level who's starting has this kind of velocity consistently. Yeah. Not that I can and, think of. And I was going to say, as we saw by the pitcher who replaced him, there was a clear difference in the two. There was, there was a clear difference. The thing that really stood out to me from watching him in person is just the sound of his fastball hitting Carter Benz's glove was different. It was that same head turning kind of different that O'Neill Cruz taking batting practice is. You know, because the first time I heard O'Neill Cruz hit a baseball, it was, I I wasn't looking and my head was just on a swivel because it was just like, who the hell? It's that kind of sound. Hey, you all. Thank you for watching. I know we try to provide the most entertaining content that we can, uh, and we'd love to spread it to as many people as possible. So uh, I know it doesn't seem like a lot, but if you could take the five seconds to like this video and subscribe to the page, it helps out so much more than you know.
Thank you, and let's go Bucks.